My brother didn't touch the weapon. He didn't know the weapon was present. He didn't foresee that someone was going to be stabbed, but he's convicted of that person's murder. It does not matter whose hand held the gun. Everyone who joined in committing the crime is equally guilty. If one person commits a crime and others knowingly join in, joint enterprise allows them to be held responsible. For years, these families have been campaigning against law, which sees people convicted of assault or murder, Justice! even if they didn't strike the fatal blow. Nine years ago, my brother ran into a spontaneous fight. One lad was stabbed to death during that fight. And my brother was convicted of his murder despite never touching that weapon. Alex Henry, Cameron Ferguson and two friends were shopping here in Ealing Broadway. A fight broke out, which is believed to have lasted less than 47 seconds. The family insists that Alex Henry threw a mobile phone at one man and punched another. And they insist that he didn't even realise there'd been a stabbing. Alex is my younger brother. We're very, very close. He was always quite reserved, an anxious person. And so I felt very, very protective of him. He was expelled from school when he was 11 years old. He went to a pupil referral unit and began getting into trouble, smoking cannabis, hanging out on the streets. My brother was out shopping in Ealing Broadway with three friends, Eunice Taib, Cameron Ferguson and Janelle Grant-Murray. While this standoff is going on, my brother's still shopping in the shopping center. He leaves the shopping center and he sees in the distance Janelle and he sees a group of strangers and he knows something's off here. So he immediately breaks into a sprint. You see him, he runs, he crosses the road. That's the last moment Alex is captured on camera. During this 47 seconds affray, Cameron Ferguson uses a concealed knife. Police found Alex on the Thursday, which was only two days later. They found him hiding out in Croydon. Alex was charged with murder on the basis that he was present at the scene of a crime. It would be then for a jury to determine the actual role played based on whether you were what's called the principal or the secondary. You didn't have to be seen as the principal, i.e. the stabber. You could be the secondary. Presence would, would suffice. I knew the Friday evening that he had been charged. He couldn't breathe, like he was screaming. Yeah, it was awful to hear him like that. I knew that Alex hadn't stabbed the person. I didn't have to ask the question. It's just, it wouldn't be something that my brother would ever do. And therefore, when the fight kicked off during the shopping trip, my brother would have remembered that and then had that glimmer of foresight that that knife would be used. You see Alex running into it. He's got his hand on his bag. Now you're saying he's reaching in to grab a knife. Where did those dots join? There was no clear evidence that there was two separate knives because the knives were um, never found. By the time the actual fatal stabbing took place, there was in an area that wasn't captured with CCTV. Your ability to 
cast doubt on the prosecution case is limited where you don't have these evidential opportunities. The trial continued following the guilty pleas under the laws of joint enterprise. You don't have to be the one that caused the fatal injury to be prosecuted for murder. I remember thinking that I wish the jury knew him because it's so impersonal. Alex is behind a screen in the dock and there's like this glass and it's, you know, you look and you think, why do they need glass? Is he dangerous? And I think if they, they knew Alex, they knew us, um, they wouldn't convict him. I didn't actually think he was going to be convicted. I didn't actually think that it was a possibility because the jury have to believe that Alex knew Cameron Ferguson had a knife. And the prosecution's closing arguments was friends tell each other everything. I thought, you can't be sure beyond reasonable doubt. And so when the verdict was handed down, mum was on the floor wailing and screaming and I was just kind of very focused on Alex, trying not to cry. Um, but ultimately, when I got home that day, I just completely broke down. After Alex was convicted, he was diagnosed with autism. It was almost like a huge part of this puzzle that now fits into place. Why was Alex like that? Why is he the way he is? Why couldn't he sit still in a classroom? Why did he refuse to go to school? Why did he have these dreadful meltdowns? It made me understand all his difficulties. The courts took a wrong turn in 1984, and it is the responsibility of this court uh, to put the law right. The law didn't take the wrong turn. The judges got it wrong. You have to intend to kill or commit serious harm. But 30 years ago, they decided that foresight was enough. After this Supreme Court ruling in 2016, many people expected that that would result in people's convictions being overturned. But instead, in order to appeal their convictions, people have had to meet this substantial injustice test, which is an extremely high threshold. The 2016 ruling happened. I honestly thought, you know, this is this is brilliant. Alex could come home. The leading expert in the field, Professor Baron Cohen, gave evidence to the Court of Appeal and basically said that Alex is autistic. Because of his autism, it's highly likely that Alex isn't guilty of this offence, considering it was 47 seconds in length, it was spontaneous, it was fast moving, and there was no prior communication between any party. Today, judges ruled that in these 10 test cases, the convictions were safe and that the rule of law was applied correctly. The deceit in that judgment to say it's irrelevant, to say it might not be credible. What more can we produce? There's nothing more we can do. We've got the best expert witness in the land. What more, what more do they want? I built his hopes so much as well. I kept saying to him, you're going to come home. I kind of had a good feeling about today because we've had such a good mo movement over the last 12 months and the Supreme Court came out in our favour. To then have all of that thrown back in our faces today, the Supreme Court might as well have never happened. I mean, I, I shouldn't have had that much faith in the justice system. I did feel betrayed by the justice system. I was devastating. After Alex was convicted, I became a lawyer because I realised that there's going to come a time where Alex's lawyers say, we can't take this case any further. And so I, I need to be prepared and I need to be ready to take that case when the time comes to fight for him. He's been inside nine years. When we talk, we're kind of re-going over our life together that we've actually had on the outside and repeating stories because there's nothing really new to talk about your relationship kind of stagnates and it's just the love for one another pulls you through. <laughs> 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 